If you've ever paid attention to your thoughts, you've noticed that they're like fleas, constantly hopping from one place to another. They appear out of nowhere, for no reason, and without any connection, creating a state of mental noise that sometimes steals most of your energy. Yet, have you ever tried to think about nothing at all? And not just for a couple of seconds, every now and then, but whenever you want, for as long as you want. Most people can't do it. In fact, most people think that it is normal to think. And the interesting thing is that they really think that. Out of an endless ocean of thoughts, one pops up, which says that thoughts cannot be stopped. However, this simple exercise puts us in front of two indisputable facts. First, your thoughts are not under your control, because if they were, you could turn them off anytime you want, for as long as you want. And, two, you tried to interrupt the flow of thoughts and perhaps you succeeded for a short time. This means that something within you tried to stop the mental activity as well inside you, and that something is not the same as your thoughts. So, who is that someone within you that tried to stop the flow of confused and unnecessary thoughts, and who opposed your intention? Try as they might, neuroscientists are still far from explaining how thoughts emerge from the activity of neurons, while psychiatrists and psychologists are struggling to understand the roots of mental illnesses. For example, a common symptom of various psychoses, particularly paranoid schizophrenia, is the belief that an outside force is controlling the patient's mind, usually through an alien voice heard in the head. On the other hand, a sane person thinks that his thoughts are his own. But if that was true, we'd think only about what we'd want, which is far from being true. Dr. Sigmund Freud, the founder of psychoanalysis, believed that a person's behavior and personality are derived from the constant and unique interaction of conflicting psychological forces that operate at three levels of awareness the conscious, preconscious, and unconscious. Freud developed his theory on the human mind by talking with his patients and paying careful attention to seemingly insignificant moments of everyday life that usually go unnoticed, such as slips of the tongue, thoughts that occur out of the blue, and especially to the patient's dreams. Freud's vision of the mind is often compared to an iceberg floating in the sea. The part of the iceberg that is above the surface of the water represents the conscious mind. This comprises all of the thoughts, wishes, feelings, and memories that are in our immediate awareness. It is the aspect of our mental processing that we can think and talk about rationally. Although it is the part of the mind that we live in most of the time, cognitive neuroscientists argue that we are conscious of only about 5% of our cognitive activity. The part of the iceberg that is submerged below the water but is still visible represents the preconscious mind anything that could potentially be brought into the conscious mind. The bulk of the iceberg that lies unseen beneath the waterline represents the unconscious. Here we will find thoughts, feelings, urges, and other information that is difficult to bring to consciousness. Experiences that are not congruent with who we think we are, memories, and emotions that have become repressed would make the material at this level. Freud supported the idea of the tabula rasa, or blank slate, according to which, individuals are born entirely free of thoughts or ideas, acquiring all their knowledge during their lifetime from experience or perception, after interacting with family and society. For example, the reason you went to study at a certain school, your choice of a career, or why you bought a particular shirt, may be a choice you reached consciously, but is also possible that education, career, or clothing style, has been influenced by a great deal of unconscious factors, parents' preferences, friends' influences, childhood experiences, and even movies you have seen, but about which you do not think when you make choices or decisions. Freud believed that human behavior is motivated by two driving instincts. Life instincts, such as the need for survival, reproduction, and pleasure, and death instincts, manifested outward as aggression toward others and inward as self-harm or suicide. In Freud's opinion, when we are in a conscious state of mind, we do not act upon our deepest desires because of the considerations of reality and morality. But when we are sleeping, the forces that make us more reserved are weakened, and a person's dreams could have access to memories and emotions that are too shameful or distressing to consciously face, as well as repressed or anxiety-provoking thoughts, mainly sexual desires, that would be repressed because of the fear of embarrassment. These unconscious thoughts and emotions appear in our dreams in a symbolic form. For someone dreaming of a large stick, Freud would view them as dreaming of a penis, but, ultimately, Freud thought it was in the dreamer's hands to interpret the meaning of their dreams.
One of the greatest opponents of Freud's theories was the Swiss psychiatrist and the founder of analytical psychology, Carl Gustav Jung. Though at one point Freud and Jung were great friends and esteemed colleagues learning from each other, their friendship soon died over their differences in beliefs. Dr. Jung disagreed with Freud's contention that human behavior is driven by sex and aggression. He argued that people are motivated by a more general psychological energy that pushes them to achieve psychological growth, self-realization, psychic wholeness, and harmony. Same as Freud, Jung believed that dreams are the bridge between the conscious and unconscious mind, and they could be retrospective in that they reflect events in childhood. However, he rejected Freud's idea that everything presented in a dream is related to a repressed sexual desire. In Jung's opinion, dreams can have many different meanings and could be also viewed as a tool to help the person come up with a solution to a problem they may face in their conscious state of mind. He also believed that dreams could anticipate what could occur in the future and they could be used as a great source of creativity. Yet, perhaps the biggest difference of opinion between Freud and Jung was related to the nature and complexity of the unconscious mind. Jung agreed with Freud's model of the unconscious, which he called the personal unconscious, but he also proposed that deeper in the psyche, beneath the layers of the personal unconscious, are other layers that have been formed over the millennia and in every member of our species. All of these layers form what Dr. Jung called the collective unconscious. Jung's realization of the collective unconscious began with an observation of a patient whose thoughts matched previous writings that the patient had never seen. He then started to discover in the dreams and fantasies of his patients, people from entirely different backgrounds, races, and creeds, images and ideas whose origins could not be traced to the individual's personal experience, and he was struck by the universality of many stories, themes, patterns, and images. In Jung's opinion, the collective unconscious underpins and surrounds the unconscious mind and is inherited at birth by every human being in the form of patterns of emotional and mental behavior, which he called the archetypes. In 1958, Dr. Jung wrote that the form of the world into which a person is born is already inborn in him as a virtual image. An example would be the mother-child relationship. Nobody tells us what a mother is, but we react in a certain way to a mothering figure, regardless of where we were born in the world, or what our race, culture, or religion is. Fear of the dark, of snakes or spiders, or the fear of death, may all be rooted in the collective unconscious. Dr. Jung believed that the mind is prefigured by evolution just as is the body, and that every person is linked to the past of the whole species. In his book, Man and His Symbols, first published in 1964, Dr. Jung wrote that, We should laugh at the idea of a plant or an animal inventing itself, yet there are many people who believe that the psyche or mind invented itself and thus was the creator of its own existence. As a matter of fact, the mind has grown to its present state of consciousness as an acorn grows into an oak or as saurians developed into mammals. As it has for so long been developing, so it still develops, and thus we are moved by forces from within, as well as by stimuli from without. These inner motives spring from a deep source that is not made by consciousness and is not under its control. In the mythology of earlier times, these forces were called mana, or spirits, demons, and gods. They are as active today as they ever were. If they conform to our wishes, we call them happy hunches or impulses and pat ourselves on the back for being smart fellows. If they go against us, then we say that it is just bad luck or that certain people are against us or that the cause of our misfortunes must be pathological. The one thing we refuse to admit is that we are dependent upon powers that are beyond our control. The motto, where there's a will there's a way, is the superstition of modern man. Yet, in order to sustain his creed, contemporary man pays the price in a remarkable lack of introspection. He is blind to the fact that, with all his rationality and efficiency, he is possessed by powers that are beyond his control. His gods and demons have not disappeared at all, they have merely got new names. They keep him on the run with restlessness, vague apprehensions, psychological complications, an insatiable need for pills, alcohol, tobacco, food, and, above all, a large array of neuroses.